Hello and welcome everybody to my Boomer Buddies podcast where we tell it like it was and is. Today I've got my Beatle Buddies. They both love the Beatles and they're here to tell us about something very special we're going to get into. First we have Trevor J. Brown and he has the Inherent Dream Podcast Network which includes 763, the local morning show, and the Trevor J. Brown Show. Trevor, welcome to my Boomer Buddies podcast. Rick, it's always great to be on your program. Thanks for having me back. Oh, more than happy to have you back. And my other Beatle buddy, we have Tim Coffey. He's got his own podcast, Love and Peace, a Beatles podcast. Tim, welcome to my Boomer Buddies podcast. It's great to be here, Rick. Thank you. And today I brought them together to talk about the 59th anniversary of the feature film Help that's starring the Beatles and their album Help. And it's quite an album for many reasons. And we're going to dip into both the film and the album. Trevor, let me start with you. You weren't alive when this was made. What makes you so fascinated with the Beatles and the Help album and movie? Well, what makes the Beatles special is when they started. We talked about this before many times off the air too, but what made them special was how they started and how they evolved. And they incorporated a lot of things in culture that they kind of created from the beginning. I mean, there weren't a lot of bands or artists at the time that were making music and films. One of the first people to do that was Elvis, obviously, but let's be honest, a lot of Elvis's films were (laughs) <laughs> not the best. The Beatles really broke new ground when it came to a film like A Hard Day's Night, when it came to Help. When you look at the album Help as a whole, it was nominated for Album of the Year in 1966. That was the first time that a rock band had ever been nominated for Album of the Year. So that in itself is a huge accomplishment. I look at the Help album as sort of a middle ground for the Beatles. You could say it's the end of the beginning era of the Beatles or the start of that middle period where you start to get new sounds and new songwriting techniques. For example, John Lennon with the Help album really dove into his Bob Dylan period with songwriting. And there's a lot of different new sounds on the album. For example, John and George bought two Fender Strats sonic blue guitars that are featured on this album paul bought two epiphone guitars there's a texan acoustic on the album there's an electric piano on the help album so lots of new cool sounds are incorporated with the help release and tim you experienced that as a young person what's your take on help and what did it mean to you and society well first and foremost the beatles were in it and to me, that's what counts. Um, and uh, after Hard Day's Night, Help was actually a little different. It had a plot, supposedly. It was directed by, by Richard Lester, his second film. And as, as Trevor mentioned, uh, Lennon was beginning his Bob Dylan period. Uh, he said he wrote the song Help because of the stress he was going through and in, in being famous. The Beatles... Uh, really tried to to do their best. I, Help was my second favorite film after Hard Day's Night, and it was in color. And, and the interesting thing was, I read where the Beatles were were constantly smoking pot throughout the entire filming. So a lot of the film was filmed early in the morning before they really got stoned. <laughs> because they couldn't remember their lines or whatever they were supposed to do. And the music is, is really good, too. It's, it's definitely worth uh, seeing, and, and I can hardly wait to when we talk about, uh, in a different episode, Hard Day's Night. Yeah, Hard Day's Night is going to be coming up on the 60th anniversary, mm-hmm. and we can do a separate show on that as well. We all know that they had a, an amazing cultural effect on society, and they still do to this day. Uh, the fact that Trevor didn't even live through that, but he is so interested in it and uh, knows so much and has come to learn so much. And Tim, we've both lived it. 
You, Tim, actually do lectures at a community college down in Northern Iowa. Trevor and I and our friend Ed Hallback went and saw you do that uh, presentation on the Beatles. So your perspective and Trevor's, even though you come from different generations, you come to pretty much the same conclusions that they were fantastic and they left a huge mark on society. Let me ask you, before we go into a rundown of the songs, Trevor, if you could put on any one song from the Help album, what would it be and why? Ticket to Ride, hands down. It's uh, in my top 10 Beatles songs. It's a phenomenal track. The drumming on it, I think, showcases some of Ringo's best. And just has a great hook. I mean, I just, I, I love that song so much. I mean, there's other amazing songs on the record, obviously. Yesterday's the most covered song of all time. But Yesterday's also one of those songs where, for me, it's now in that category of, I've heard it so much. And look, I know Paul McCartney's a big listener of the My Boomer Buddies podcast. So, Paul, if you're listening right now, we love you. But if you had to say, Trevor, give me five songs of Beatles that you never have to hear again, I would put Yesterday on that list just because I've heard it so many times. So for me, it's 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 Ticket to Ride, just the overall package, lyrics. But again, I think it's one of Ringo's finest finest drumming songs. Tim, how about you? Well, I certainly agree with Trevor. But, but the other song that really fascinates me is You've Got to Hide Your Love Away. And that's that's a, a pure Lennon song. I remember in the movie, Lennon was sitting back or laying down playing his guitar and the other Beatles were standing up. They were in their, I don't know, townhouse or whatever it was. And again, that's that's part of his Bob Dylan period too. That's kind of a raw Lennon song. So, Mine, I did just have to say, as an adult looking back and reanalyzing, I, I like You've Got to Hide Your Love Away as well. But as a kid, I loved Help, the title song. It had such drive and energy. And I understand that John Lennon, when he wrote that, like you said, he was trying to deal with fame. It came very quickly. I know they worked the clubs and everything, but once it came, it hit hard and fast. And what do you do? You can't go anywhere without getting mauled and attacked. But uh, he liked a slower version. I think for most of us, pretty happy that they did a fast, hard driving version. So help would have to be it for me. Well, let's go through the discography here. The first song is the title track, Help. What do you remember, Tim, hearing that on the radio for the first time? What was your emotion? How did you feel about that? Well, being a McCartney fan, I, I was waiting for Paul to come in. and But Paul and George sang the background uh, in that. Mm -hmm. And it was a good, fast version, too. And the beat, it kind of showed the cohesion of, of all four Beatles in their presentation, and certainly in their songwriting uh, ability. Yeah, and they're using layers on this album, too. Uh, Trevor had mentioned the different instruments they're trying. The layering, for example, taking the guitar tracks and keeping that separate from the bass and the drums, that was not normal. And they did that, George Martin did that, to uh, be able to have stereo effect later on. Trevor, how about you with help? John mentioned that when he wrote the song he didn't necessarily know it was autobiographical but then later on he was like i was actually crying out for help at the time because he didn't know how to deal with everything that was going on mm -hmm. in his life and the fame and beatlemania and all this craze that happened i mean think of the progression that these guys went on but especially everything that lennon went through in his life from being in school and he wasn't a very good student and he lived with his aunt and then he loses his mother in a car accident. And then they, you know, also during this stretch, you have playing in Hamburg and the Cavern Club and Beatlemania craze and all of these different things happening. And that's a lot of growth, a lot of growing up in, in a, in a short period of time. He mentioned that later on, I think it was in the, the Playboy interview many years later that he's like, oh, well, this is, uh, I was actually crying out for help. And sometimes when you go back and you read some of these lyrics from artists and you're like, oh, you didn't really get it at the time, but then you're like, oh, well, I get it. He also mentioned it was one of his favorite songs that he ever did with the Beatles as well. So, and usually John was somebody that was very quick to call a song that the Beatles did 
rubbish or mm-hmm. granny music, some of Paul's things. But uh, when John liked one of your things or John liked something that he did, you knew you knew what he meant. And uh, so it must have been one of his favorites. And then the number two song on side one was The Night Before. Very well done. Do you have any take on that? The Beatles, when they wrote songs, it was usually about drugs or sex. And they had to be very coy about it because of the times. Right. I don't know the history behind the song, though, but it has underlings of sexual connotations in it. Good for Paul, you know. Trevor, any take on that? Interesting on this song, we we get that first sort of use of an electric piano on a on a Beatles song, so that's kind of clever. You've got to hide your love away, Tim's favorite. Yeah, yeah, that great Lennon song. Obviously, strong Dylan influence here. We never really got quite the answer as to what it was about. Some people say a perspective is like an affair. As an adult, others say that Lennon wrote it for Brian Epstein, who was gay so we don't quite know that also another uh interesting fact you get the tenor and alto flutes at the end of the song and you think of all these different instruments that the beatles started to use with rubber soul revolver sergeant peppers later on in their discography so we're starting to see more unique instruments on a song like this the fourth selection on side one is a george harrison contribution to the album i need you with some rather clever and unique guitar work real unique sound on the guitar and i think for some people that might hear that song for the first time i know there's even people that hear it today that have heard that song for many times like is that even a guitar like what does that sound it is a guitar it's played by george and he actually used a a volume foot pedal on the song that you can control that that sound that's coming out so it's uh Again, very unique. I've used that that word many times when talking about help, but we're starting to see a lot of different changes musically. They're starting to, you can see they're getting a little tired of being on the road and they're getting a little tired of Beatlemania and they're starting to experiment a little bit more in the studio. And we're going to see that more. I go back to the yearning that they have, especially uh, from Paul and, and I think George too, of drugs and sex. But again, those are the Beatles. Yeah, I should po- po- point out too, George always had a fight to get his music on. And he he felt uh, that it, it was hard to fight uh, McCartney Lennon. But again, he put out some great music on his own. Absolutely. And the fifth selection, Another Girl. I'm sure they're addressing the singer's girlfriend here. Yeah, good old sex. Okay. I find it fascinating on the track listing that another gal and you're going to lose that gal are right next to each other because (laughs) what do you think another girl is actually about to me i feel it's like well there's another girl here so you better treat me well and paul sings that one and then on the very next song you have john saying yeah but you're gonna lose that girl so what girl is he talking about like there's too many girls here tim do you have anything to add to that it's true. No. They're, they're listed together, another girl, and you're going to lose that girl. Perfectly <laughs> said by Trevor. And then the last song on side one is Ticket to Ride, Trevor's favorite Beatles song on the Help album. Ringo is so underrated. I mean, yeah. just so underrated. And he just shines on this track. It's great. You hear those drum rolls. What always gets me, too. And they're like, well, what, what, what's so special about the Ringo drumming on that? On the chorus where it does the, where he does the drum roll, and then on the very last time, there's not the drum roll. He just hits the 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 snare drum once, and just that change, it's so effective. I love this song. It's just a a, a great Beatles song, and uh, again, he he truly shines on it. And it became the Beatles' seventh consecutive number one hit in the United Kingdom and their third consecutive number one in the U.S. Great song. Yep. Now we're going to jump over to side two. This is one of my favorites, actually. The first song on side two is Act Naturally. It's a Morrison-Russell composition that uh, Buck Owens had done. Ringo takes his turn. Great song. I love it. I, I love the, the harmony that McCartney comes in and, and sings in the background. And it's a fun song. I've seen them on TV perform that and it looked like they were really having a good time uh, with that song. 
Yeah, and it's a really good fit for Ringo, too. And it's about time he, he gets a chance to shine. You know, he drums fabulously, like Trevor pointed out. There's a lot of subtleties that drummers say, oh, it can't be that hard. And then they try to play it. He was playing a right-handed set, left-handed, for one thing. And he had to master that his own way. If I'm just listening to one or two songs off the album, which is hard to do, I'll put Act Naturally on. The number two song on there, fellas, It's Only Love, a Lennon composition. John hated this song. He said it was terrible lyrics. It was rubbish. It was filler. I don't mind it. I mean, it, it, there's honestly, boys, there's, there's, I don't skip any Beatles songs. I, I know, like, if you're in a crunch for time and you're taking a car ride down the street to go get gas, maybe you only can listen to one or two songs on a Beatles album. But the beautiful thing about the Beatles is they legitimately made records like you can put it on tra side one track one and mm -hmm. let it play all the way through and there's is... so yeah john thought it was filler but i i think it's a fine song well again it, here's the beatles writing about love that's almost a permanent theme throughout most of their music and we also and, have to remember fellows that this is for a movie a lot of these songs were put into the movie or written for the movie the third song fellows on side two you Like Me Too Much, another Harrison song. Actually, that's one of my favorite George songs. It's a simple song. It says a lot. And, and George does a, a great job of performing it. Trevor? I think this record really started to maybe not showcase George in the sense of the two contributions he has on the album are his best. Obviously, his best is yet to come. But I think he's gaining a little bit more confidence by this album. And then we start to see him come out a little bit more. You know, the next album's Rubber Soul, but then by Revolver, not only does he have more contributions, one of his best songs leads off the album with Taxman. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a, a lot of growth here that we're seeing from George, starting especially with this record. The next song is Tell Me What You See, McCartney on lead. Yeah. Well, again, the harmony in that song is incredible. The Beatles looked at their their recording studio as as an experimental lab. As, as Trevor uh, pointed out uh, several times, they're always putting in new things or doing things differently. And But the harmony was always there between John and George and, and Paul, too. I agree with Tim. I mean, great, great harmonies on this song. Paul, at one point, came out and said it's album filler, but you got to have some of those songs on the album to, to have a full cohesive unit i think the uh the harmonies on this speak for themselves and the fifth song on side two i've just seen a face mccartney it's a quick song he seems really happy when he's singing it but believe it or not this is paul said this was a song that he wrote about marijuana for years i thought what a great little love song it's all about pot. it's all about pot <laughs> i've just seen a face dated back all the way to he played it at one point for his auntie Jen and auntie Jen loved this, this little ditty that he did. And they put some words to it. He wrote it at the parents of Jane Asher's house. He dated Jane Asher for, for many years before he met Linda McCartney is his eventual wife. So I, I really enjoy this song. I think it's one of the stronger songs on the record. Yep. Me too. And Trevor, you called it a ditty, and that's probably the word that I was searching for. It is a ditty. You know, he loved to do British style songs, mm -hmm. kind of old, old style. I probably got a lot of that from his family of Auntie Jen. I had an Auntie yeah. Jen. Whenever I'd hear him sing about Auntie Jen and wings or whatever, yeah, uh, I always thought of my Auntie Jen. So, and then of course we come into the song that Trevor could care less if he hears it again. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm mischaracterizing it. I know what you meant. It's a yeah. song that that gets played way, 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 way too much, but it's still a great composition. Yes. Scrambled eggs. I mean, yesterday. You know, boys, this song was rejected by Billy J. Kramer and Chris Farlow. I don't even know who that is. I mean, imagine that. I mean, your career could have maybe taken a little bit different of a trajectory if you would have said, sure, I'll, I'll sing that song. I'm, but maybe not either. I don't know. But obviously a classic. There's certain songs that Paul McCartney, until the end of days for him, he'll have to perform live. And this is just a staple in his set that has to be there. Well, think about it. This is the only Beatles song that only one Beatle 
did. And uh, it had uh, strings in there that, that George Morton brought in. And But it's, it's also a song that uh, McCartney went around to different people over a period of time before he recorded it, um, humming it, thinking that he was stealing somebody else's song. And when he was convinced that, no, this is an original song that he dreamt about, um, then that's when he, he said, okay, I'll, I'll record it. And I have a memory of watching him play that by himself on the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah. And even as a young, younger kid, I, I thought, wow, how intimidating that must be to sit there and play that on your own. And he's playing guitar. And, yep. you know, I'm naively thinking, well, he's a bass player. Well, he could play guitar as good as anybody. Well, he started off playing guitar. So with the Beatles. I mean, he brought this song to the other guys and John and George and Ringo pretty much said, there's nothing we can do with this. You should play it by yourself. Yeah. They didn't veto the song though. The Beatles had a very strong veto system where if they played a song for everybody and one of the boys said, Nope, I don't like it. They didn't do it. So one of them could have easily said, Nope, it's not for us or there's nothing we can do with it. And what if John would have just been like, Nope, don't like it. We're done. <laughs> We're done. And then we never hear yesterday, but John, even knew from that, I mean, it showed him kind of being selfless, like, Hey, there's nothing I can do with this to help you. You should just perform it on your own. So think about that. That's, that's pretty neat. And if somebody like Billy J Kramer or Chris Barlow had done it, who knows it might've tanked too. True. Right. So. And, and, and I always think about this when, I, uh, when I saw uh, McCartney sing that it takes a special skill to sing and play a musical instrument at the same time. And of course, Paul pulled it off perfectly. Yeah, well said. And then the last song, song seven on side two is Dizzy Miss Lizzie, a Larry Williams song and Lennon loved his stuff. It really brought out the rocker in, in John. And John was always conscientious about his voice. He wasn't comfortable with it. This is one of those songs where he really came out as a true rock and roll singer. What's also special about this is this also shows the power of sequencing that George Martin and the band had, the dynamics. You get a delicate song like Yesterday, which very easily could have ended this album, but instead they're like, nope, we're going to come and we're going to rock out one more time with Dizzy Miss Lizzie. And we saw the dynamics even more with later releases, look at an album like the White Album, where you get a song like Helter Skelter, and that goes into Long, Long, Long. You know, Sgt. Pepper, She's Leaving Home, and, and then some of the more rockier moments on that as well. So that was pretty neat, in my opinion, for a band at that time. They really showcased that, hey, we can do this delicate little number, but then we can also kick your teeth in, too, with some, yeah. some nice rock and roll. That's why they were so great. They could shift gears, and it was great either way, Tim. And, and, and I'd like to think that Dizzy Miss Lizzie is it's a perfect example of them rocking and rolling for six to eight hours a day in, in Hamburg, where they came back a completely different, much tighter rock and roll group uh, to the point where a lot of people didn't even recognize their music uh, uh, after they came back. Great transformation. Trevor, you nailed it. This album is the end of the first and the beginning of the second phases of the Beatles. Just all around, 65, 66 is probably my favorite period of the Beatles, me personally. Musically and aesthetically, I thought they were just at a cool point in their careers. I have to ask you guys one question. What was the B-side of Help? I'm Down. I'm Down is correct. Guys, we've been talking about the track listing from the Parlophone album. And I know there's variations on Capitol and some of the other ones, and they were spread out over two or three different albums. But this is the one, listeners and watchers, that we focused on. Trevor, when you think of the Beatles as they were winding down with the infighting and all that, the end of a relationship, what what do you take out of that relationship that you can pull back to their beginning days? Did they have any moments in the end days that brought a little life? And I'm talking about that documentary now. I'd have to really think on that a little bit more. 
as to the overall scope. There's different things that I picked up from that documentary. For example, I'm reading a John Lennon book right now that came out in the 80s that offers a lot of different perspective and stories on things that I had like no clue. And a lot of the fighting amongst Lennon and McCartney in terms of lawyers and the Apple company. And, but obviously I wasn't there. I don't know Paul McCartney. I don't know John Lennon. I don't know Ringo Starr. I don't know George Harrison, but just some of the back and forth between Paul and John in the press. I know that at times they were heated. I get that. But there were some letters that were published in a musical magazine called Melody Maker in the early 70s, where Paul was interviewed by somebody with Melody Maker and pretty much came out and said, this is why I feel this way. We should just sign the pieces of paper for the lawyers and get this over and done with. So we each take a quarter of the Apple company that they started, and then we can be formally done. Well, John responded to that with another letter, and this is in this book that I'm reading right now. And John can be very vicious at times with what he's saying back to Paul. But also there's this sense that you get of this whimsical John Lennon, because in this letter to Paul, which they published, he's also making jokes and he's like, well, what did you mean by this? And it's not so tense and serious. Maybe it was meant that way, but he also shows some of his personality in it. So at the end of the day, what I gather, I wasn't alive then. And again, I don't know these people. It was just brothers fighting. And sometimes brothers need to be apart for a while. And then they come back together. And unfortunately, we never got that because John was shot dead in in New York in 1980. We never got to see that again. Um, But brothers fight. They were around each other for a long time touring the world. And, uh, you know, it's just it's unfortunate that it that it came to that well a couple things i just came across something the other day Uh, john sent paul a a telegram inviting him and and wings to be part of a charity concert with the rolling stones and who was the third group i i can't remember he was very complimentary of of paul he said he said something like you're really doing a good job with wings and complimented Paul on that. And Paul basically said no. There was never ever ever a charity thing uh, that that John did, George did, but not John. But the other thing I I think about is their final album that they recorded, Abbey Road, was really kind of an album like their early music. And I remember reading that Paul called up George Martin and said, hey, we we want to come in to the studio and, and do one final album. And George Martin said, I'll, I'll help you guys, but only if you're pleasant and, and decent and civil to each other. Now, a lot of the, the fighting between Paul and, and the Beatles were all about the manager. Paul wanted his father-in-law, John Eastman, who was an uh, entertainer, lawyer, to, to be their manager. But uh, Alan Klein uh, was the favorite by the other three. And, and they, they ended up, I think, suing and firing Alan Klein, just like the Stones did. And I think he got convicted for tax evasion or something like that, too. But I, I think of, of the end in the Abbey Road album sense, um, and the music was really, really good. And he got two outstanding, and I mean really outstanding, Beatles songs that were George's, Something and Here Comes the Sun. Mm-hmm. Um, just really <laughs> incredible songs. In fact, again, I, I remember uh, reading Frank Patrick came out and said that uh, something and was a great Lennon McCartney song. Well, it wasn't. It was George Harrison. You know. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Take credit when, whenever you can, I guess. Well, and that was something too. With you mentioned Alan Klein and the Beatles had all of these these other interests too. Not only were they the Beatles, but they started Apple Corps and they started finding all these different musicians to sign to their label. When Brian Epstein died in 1967 of the accidental drug overdose, that was kind of the beginning of the end yeah. right there, because Brian was the glue that held all these uh, all everything together. When Brian died, Paul sort of took that leadership role of here's what we're going to do, boys. And sometimes 
that worked. I mean, Sergeant Pepper at that point was already out. So to yeah. kind of pivot to magical mystery tour and continue that world for a little bit. And then they did the white album, which was sort of a back to basics approach, uh, with, with songwriting, but it makes you wonder like if Brian wouldn't have, have passed away, maybe they just take a little bit of a break. Like some bands do today, a year, year and a half, two years and say, Hey, we're going to reconvene in a couple of years and, and see what happens. And if you want to go make a solo album, go make a solo album. You want to go act, go act. If you want to go and smoke pot, do, you know, do whatever you want. Uh, but at the end of the day, we will never know. But the other aspect of that too, Ryan Epstein's key role were, were two things, uh, get a record contract, which, which he did and set up tours. And in 66, they quit touring. Yeah. Because of the, the stress and, and the hassle of it. And they had families. They were in a completely different personal situation. But you know what? They really thrived on each other. And they really, they, I think they, yeah, even though they fought, they I think they really loved each other too. They've been through so much together. And mm -hmm. when you think back, here are four lads from a working class environment in Liverpool, England. And the impact that they had, not only in music, but culture, politics, the world, um, uh, still to this day. And Brian Epstein, by the way, was kind of the father of the British invasion because he managed other uh, British groups that, that came over here, too. But, yeah, the Beatles led the way. Sixty years later, we're still playing their music. We're still talking about them. There's still books coming out about them. Obla di, obla da. Life goes on. bra. In the Abbey Road documentary, it was pretty cool seeing behind the scenes things like George Harrison helping Ringo with Octopus's Garden, jumping in on the piano and giving advice. And you could see there was some chemistry there and he wanted to help. And do you think that, along with some other things in that documentary, made them want to feel like they were going back to the old days the way they used to record? Absolutely. I think it was the connection of everything and that everything that you see from from being that fly on the wall that experience whenever i watch things that anything beatles i mean the beatles are done they've been done for for a very long time so i'm i'm always so enthused when i get to hear anything at all new or see anything new because there's probably hundreds of hours of footage somewhere of them in a studio or them recording something. I mean, in all honesty, I would take uh, them chatting at a dinner table, having tea and lunch. I, I would listen to that because if that's all we have, I, I would appreciate that. I want to dive into their minds. I want to see how they structure songs and, and, and all of that. It's all, it's all new to me because there's, there's, we're not going to get a new Beatles album. Like it's, it's not going to be there. So anytime we see something like that and be able to dive into their minds and the creativeness and just how smart George Harrison is. I mean, Ringo's there playing Octopus's garden on the piano and George hops right in and knows exactly what key it's in. And it's, it's incredible. These guys, Tim. Well, again, it's, it's incredible to see in that, that documentary, they were still together. They were, completely changed individuals from the time that they started. They were single. Well, John was married, but the, the rest were, were single. Uh, they were young. When, when they did Abbey Road, they were married. They had families. They were in a completely different personal situation. But you know what? Uh, they really thrived on each other. Yeah, even though they fought, they, I think they really loved each other, too. They've been through so much together. And... Mm -hmm. When you think back, here are four lads from a working class environment in Liverpool, England, and the impact that they had, not only in music, but culture, politics, the world, uh, still to this day. And Brian Epstein, by the way, was kind of the father of the British invasion, because he managed other uh, British groups that, that came over here too. But yeah, the Beatles led the way. 60 years later, we're still playing their music. We're still talking about them. There's still books coming out about them. And obla di, obla da, life goes on, brah. Just read this recently. The movie Help was kind of the vehicle that spurned TV shows like Batman 
and also the monkeys. Yes, very true. And they tried to recreate the magic, the cool goofiness that the Beatles had in their movies. Well, fellas, we're going to have to leave it there. I appreciate you talking about the Beatles on the 59th anniversary of Help, both the movie and the album. It's always interesting listening to you two talk about the Beatles. Your knowledge is, is amazing and your love for the Beatles comes through. Trevor, 763 Local Morning Show, the Trevor J. Brown Show on Inherent Dream Podcast. Trevor, where can they hear your shows? Worldwide, or you can just go to InherentDream.com. We're pretty much anywhere where you get good podcasts. Thanks for being on again. Thanks so much, Rick. And Tim Coffey, lecturer, Beatles expert. He has the show Love and Peace, a Beatles podcast. Yeah, it's on Spotify and Buzzsprout. We talked about help today, plus a few more Beatle tidbits, and it's been wonderful. Once again, guys, thanks so much for being on my Boomer Buddies podcast. For Tim Coffey. Trevor J. Brown, I'm Rick Reed. Till next time, we'll see you around the block. If you enjoy this podcast and are viewing on YouTube, please like, hit the subscribe button on your screen and share it with your friends and feel free to comment below. You can also hear us on Spotify and Buzzsprout. Feel free to email comments to myboomerbuddies4 at gmail.com. <laughs>